The Tom Woods Show, episode 840. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. If your homeschool program is making you crazy and running you ragged, don't wait till next term to fix it. Check out the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum right now. Plus, get $160 worth of free bonuses when you join through my link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. Folks, I've just released another free ebook, this one called Education Without the State. Grab your copy at nostateeducation.com or by texting the word EDUCATE to 33444. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. We all know now about what happened at uh, Berkeley the other day with Milo Yiannopoulos with uh, left-wing savages burning things down and assaulting people and destroying property and generally being uh, idiots and you know, about what you expect from these people. But uh, and of course we get the usual spineless response from the university administration. Every one of these, every one of these people, if if any of those violent people were actually enrolled at the university, they should all be immediately expelled. If there is anybody with any sense in charge. Well, anyway, I was going to do as I told you the other day an episode by myself today talking about that whole matter. But given how time sensitive it is, and given that Scott Greer has a book on more or less this topic, I thought, let's get Scott on. Scott is deputy editor at The Daily Caller. He's the author of the new book, No Campus for White Men, The Transformation of Higher Education into Hateful Indoctrination. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right. This is... I was about to say this book is really timely, but on the other hand, it'd be timely no matter when you released it. You don't have to ever fe ever feel like, well, guess I missed that opportunity. I'll never be able to promote this book again. Uh, all you have to do is sit there and just wait five minutes, and you have another promotional opportunity. Absolutely. I think I, even after right after uh, Donald Trump was elected president, even colleges have gotten even crazier. I think over the last two or three years, it Colleges have gotten a lot loopier than they've than they've always been. I mean, they've always been very hotbeds of radicalism. We saw this even in, in the late '80s and early '90s. There was a big concern about political correctness then, when a lot of these gender studies and race studies and all these different academic fields that are designed just to appease identity politics were created. But now it's even more radical now because it's not just that they want these studies there; they want to have the Anybody who challenges those studies removed from campus for threatening students' very psyches and, and their very physical safety. So it's gotten a lot more ridiculous. But now I think with the election of Donald Trump, I mean, the day after we had cry-ins uh, at Ivy League universities, and now we have the riots in Berkeley just for one conservative showing up on campus to share his views. It seems like just over the past year, the the left in general mostly on the campuses but but even in general has become much much more hysterical even than they used to be now the common term is white supremacist mm -hmm. or even nazi everybody's a white supremacist or a nazi but not according to any definition that would make sense to anybody and if you look at the nazi political program Pretty much none of those things are believed by any of us who are being accused of these things. Absolutely none. Nothing. Or you know, Steve Bannon. You may have some disagreements with him, but I see zero evidence that he's a white supremacist. And yet even Nancy Pelosi, not some idiotic low IQ campus agitator, but Nancy Pelosi, our idiotic low IQ member of Congress, gets up and says – Steve Bannon is a white supremacist. What's the evidence for this? What is the evidence? What, that he talks about interracial crime or something? That makes you a, that means you want to have laws where you officially are able to oppress other groups. This is the insanity that they, they cannot admit there are other points of view. I, I concede there are other points of view. And sometimes I can kind of see, even if I think it's only superficial, the plausibility of other points of view. That we are, we have been totally dehumanized by them. And I'm, I'm sorry to be talking the whole time. I'll, I'll stop in a minute. But they, acu they accuse us of dehumanizing them or excluding them. But really, we're the ones who are accused of being things we clearly are not, that we absolutely disavow and have never embraced. And we don't, we're not even entitled to a response because of how evil we are. We're not even fully human so we can be punched. All the things they pretend are happening to them, they're actually doing to us. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And the reason why they go to these hyperbolic terms like Nazi, white supremacist, white nationalist, you know, everybody's a white nationalist or a white supremacist now, according to the left. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, they say Steve Bannon, Stephen Miller, these aides to Trump, Donald Trump himself, you know, eventually Jared Kushner and Ivanka are going to be hardcore neo-Nazis, even though they're Orthodox Jews. But everybody is going to just be these uh, this hysterical terms. But the reason why they do it is exactly as you pointed out, it's to dehumanize them. If you say that they're Nazis, you don't just say that I disagree with their point of view. You turn them into these menacing dangers, these total monsters that don't deserve free speech. They don't deserve the rights to protection from the law. You can punch them. You need to assault them. You need to riot when they speak. And so they bring these terms down to such, you know, you know, awful terms that are not even relevant just so they can suppress their speech because it makes more easily. If you just say, I don't like this person because he's a conservative, well, that's not that very good of an argument. That's boring. They don't want to say it. But it spices it up. It's like this person's a Nazi. It's almost kind of a marketing tactic to say that this person is these is a, has a horrific ideology rather than just saying, oh, well, he's a you know a conservative who believes in immigration restriction. Yawn. They're not going to pay attention to that. They just have to put it in these more hysterical terms. But when it even goes with uh, Nancy Pelosi and other Democrats, uh, as I point out in my book, it's not just the right that these uh, that a lot of these campus leftists are saying white supremacists. It's all whites are racist. Right. I right. mean, there's that old uh, hardcore punk song by Minor Threat. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Guilty of being white, where everybody is guilty of being white, and you have this. You have to have this shame just for these actions of ancestors that you have, or even, you know, people you weren't related to. I mean, if your family came in the late 19th century from Poland, you know, you're still guilty for slavery, even though you had no, absolutely zero connection to it. And everybody shares in this blame. And I examine that in my book. And it's, it's very hostile because they want to say that race is a social construct. And yet they're trying to blame an entire race for sins of the past that even their ancestors weren't even involved in. And it becomes not really necessary to bother to fact check or anything. If somebody is an offender, then we can just call them all kinds of names. Just the other day on Facebook, can you believe I still do? I've got to stop this. I somehow got into some thread where somebody was criticizing a person I won't name and, and listing all the things this guy was guilty of. And yeah, he wants to expel all non-Christians. And I said, I don't think the person you're talking about is actually a Christian. He said, well, I assumed because he's a Nazi, he must be a Christian. I said, well, that's a funny thing. You assumed because he's a Nazi? He's a Christian? I said, th- a lot of the, I mean, the neo-Nazis, the real ones today, really they don't know where they stand on Christianity because it's universalist and they are not universalist. Mm-hmm. So he knew nothing about that. And I said, by the way, and he said, well, you know, uh, Hitler never had any problem and I said, with with uh, Christi- or Christianity. Catholicism never had any problem with Hitler and vice versa. And I said, all right, uh, here's your here's your assignment on Google. Name me the church where Hitler went to mass. That should be easy. You got all of Google. Go ahead and tell me. And of course, you know, there, there's no answer because he didn't go to mass, right? There is no answer to that question. Mm-hmm. But none of them know anything. So it's, it, I guess what gets me as a guy who, you know, I do, I do stuff like this that's more provocative, but I write books and I've written some academic books, is the, that not only are they thugs and violent, but they're stupid. They're <laughs> stupid thugs and violent. Like they can't even know anything. All right, l- let's get into some of the uh, topics in your book. I want, let's get into identity, the identity politics chapter. Now, mm-hmm. here you're. I mean, we uh, here in in some ways the the topic really is these some of these uh, academic disciplines that cater to particular groups. There are no academic disciplines that cater to me. There mm-hmm. are no discipline. Oh, they'll say, oh, Western civilization caters to you. No, no, no. I go to Western civilization, and it's all about how terrible I am. So that, that even that one doesn't cater to me. But the point is, there's no there's no conservative studies. There's no navel gazing for me. So tell me about that well yeah and even you mentioned with western civilization they're starting to get rid of those courses because they promote white supremacy so they don't even allow that exactly but with the with the identity politics is when you get into college campus they if you're a part of a protected class or a minority group you're uh, allowed to have the strong identity that's the core part of your being whether you're you know transsexual african-american hispanic that becomes the core part of your identity at college campus and a lot of it it comes from the admissions process when you're applying to college there's a course of affirmative action available. And if you get into college just on the basis of your race or sexual orientation, that shows you that there's a benefit to playing up your identity, to forming that as your core being. And if you're getting benefits from that at the start of college, why not carry it on for the, re- for the rest of your four years? And that's what we're seeing a lot now with like a lot of these kids that they come in and a lot of these protest movements are based on that 
just these racialized notions that this school is not helping African Americans and all our demands are about helping our specific identity group. Um, and then there's some of these things are getting more ridiculous, such as they want segregated housing now. There's a lot of African American uh, student groups who are now demanding uh, special housing that's segregated, that's cheaper just for them and exclusively for them. And they're demanding this, even though this is clearly bringing back Jim Crow in a different manner, of course, but instead they're demanding a return of Jim Crow, but instead they get the better housing this time. Uh, but it's, when colleges campuses have this, they have all these different studies that are allowed to, that encourage these minority groups to have incredible pride in their being a minority and, and see themselves and see their whole world as this way. And it puts, pits them in opposition towards uh, whiteness or, you know, they don't even really define that very well, but in opposition toward whiteness and Western civilization. And that's why they're getting rid of the Western civilization and Western culture introductory courses, because they don't want to teach uh, so-called white supremacy to students. And it's becoming a very troubling form of tribalism. I mean, when we see this in countries where you have these strong groups who see themselves not as Americans or as a part of the national body, they just see them as their uh, individual um, ethnic or racial group, you see you know, there's intense troubles in that nation. You can look at Austria-Hungary in the in the 19th century where they had all these different nationalities and they didn't see themselves as a part of the Austrian Empire. They saw them themselves as Hungarian or, or Slovene or Austrian. They didn't see themselves as that. And it starts to break up the nation state and there's no chance for unity. And we're starting to see that on campus. But it, right now, uh, with the individual identity groups, it's basically non-white minorities pitted against whites. And they kind of encourage this, and they get rewards for this from administrators who uh, push forward these ideas and encourage them with uh, their individual study programs. I, I'm, you know, identity politics, eh, I don't, I don't really care if people think about their race as being their most important thing. If, if, if to some people that's what is the most important thing in their lives, well, that's the most important thing. Or their sexuality, if that's their most important thing. What I care about more is the emotional hypochondria, where they feel like everybody's against them. There's systematic, systemic oppression throughout the society. I just find this laughable, that you could think in this society there's systemic oppression of you if you are uh, – any type, any type of minority, because th think, think of it this way. When you go to apply to college, what group would you want to belong to? Would, would, it be, would you want to be white? You want to check off that white box on the application? Uh, who in his right mind wants to check off the white box? So where's the where's the so-called privilege? Now, to the contrary, you are uh, – especially if you are in the LGBTQ community – well, I mean, you're you're welcomed with open arms on every single camp. There's no campus where you genuinely feel for your fear for your safety. Whereas everywhere Milo goes, he, he could get he could get shot and killed. Mm -hmm. But nobody feels like I might actually get shot and killed if I'm flamboyantly open about who I am. They absolutely do not feel that way. So uh, what what were, what was your reaction to the whole? Because Milo wrote the foreword to your book, so let's get into that in a minute. But what was your initial response? I mean, it w I suppose it was about the same as everybody else's when you saw this Berkeley matter. Yeah, and, and as I described in No Chemist Friedman, this is victim of culture almost reaching its extreme fringe right here. I mean, one of the protesters uh, right before they started rioting says that Milo's words rape and killed me and my people. And I was like, what? what? <laughs> it's like, how is this happening? Yeah, somebody was one of the protest uh, demonstrators, uh, speakers, like his words encouraged the rape, uh, raping and killing me. And I was like, what? I don't think there's any evidence of that. And there's what words? They never yeah. give me an example. <laughs> No, they don't. And then they just say, well, he said something bad about Islam or immigrants. So it's like, and that's not hurting you. You know, you just, as a part of democracy, you have to accept words that you're not going to like, and you're going to have to, you know, toughen up. I mean, if we just wanted to build an entire safe space in our country, you know, that we can go back to the Soviet Union. I mean, technically that was a safe space because they had to make sure that all, the word, only certain words um, didn't offend any of the leaders. So that's a very kind of mentality. But they try to have this hysterical rhetoric about how it's threatening their physical security because it's a much better argument than saying, oh, I just disagree with these ideas. And that's the same with Milo. They don't just say, well, I disagree with his uh, rhetoric on immigration because I think immigration is a good thing and yada, yada, yada. Here's all the facts for that. No, it's better to just say, 
I feel threatened. This threatens me. I'm going to die if somebody says this. Even though there's clearly no cases for that. that, And if, you know, we had a sane administrators, they would laugh at it and be like, go back and just, you know, cool down. (laughs) Maybe we'll get you a mental health expert to help you out with these problems. But now they just take this seriously because it's a much better argument for them. It works much more efficiently than saying, I disagree with these points. Here's the facts. Here's some reasons. And this is why you shouldn't be allowed on campus. But instead saying that this threatens my physical safety, it lets them have a better argument for administrators to shut down people like Milo Yiannopoulos from coming on campus. And it, now it not only just shows how they can stop him from speaking on campus, it also argues for, gives them moral legitimacy to commit acts of violence towards him and his supporters. Because they're not, they can, I saw this with a lot of these things with a lot of people on Twitter who were like saying, oh, well, we had to attack him because he's apparently going to dox undocumented immigrants on at UC Berkeley. And I was like, well, do you know that for a fact? And how is that threatening their safety? And that, and they're here legally. I mean, there's an argument that's saying he's actually doing a public service, but they just use that and saying he's threatening people. Thus, we had to, you know, beat his supporters with steel pipes. And they use this argument, and there's a lot of moral legitimacy. They get moral legitimacy by just claiming that he's uh, threatening their physical security. And we, unfortunately, this is how they're going to justify riots and further violence. I have a libertarian show, and so once in a while I'll get somebody who says, look, we all know there are crazy people on campus, but, you know, what does this have to do with the government? I mean, we, the state is our real opponent, and the fact that people are just goofing off at universities doesn't really matter to libertarians one way or the other. I, d- I disagree with that, but, but mainly because, you know, the old expression, the children are our future. This is – these are the people who are going to graduate from elite universities and be telling the rest of us what to do. Th- these are the people who think the rest of us are Nazis and uh, you know whatever, white supremacists and all that. So it does matter what's going on because this will be translated into action. You better believe if we're not careful. You saw that item I suppose some time ago. Uh, I wrote about it a couple of weeks ago with – I guess it was at Bowling Green – where uh, I follow campusreform.org very closely. And, oh, they're a great website. Oh, yeah. It was an item where there was a – it was it looked like an overhead projector or something, had a white cover on it. And so from the outside, if you really looked at it and squinted, it looked kind of like a Klansman wearing a hood. Oh, yeah. But obviously it's not because you know a Klansman wearing a hood – probably moves around a little and doesn't just stand exactly immobil- immobilized for hours on end. And But yet this one student took a picture of it, tweeted it at the college president and said, how is this fostering inclusion and diversity? So the student was so dumb and tone deaf that she thought there was an actual Klan rally going on on her campus. Because they always use the scientific classrooms for their Klan rallies. I, I hear that's, yeah, a, that's a big thing. And they, lots of flammable material there. Yeah, exactly. So then the president comes back with, we looked into it. It was a piece of lab equipment, uh, a cover on a piece of lab equipment. But the fact, that, look, you know how many Klansmen there are in the entire country? About 3,000. That's 60 per state. Mm-hmm. This girl thought she was, I mean, you have a better chance of being struck by lightning than casting your gaze on a Klan rally. They've whipped the these these kids into unbelievable hysteria and in your book your one of your first chapters begins with slavery segregation ku klux klan they see this everywhere i now my i guess my question is is there anything that you th- are there any reforms you think there can be that might turn things around is this hopeless what would you do if you were let's say in charge somehow well, the first thing is to get administrators to have a backbone because the reason why these students keep imagining, uh, imagine, uh, you know, Klansmen, uh, time traveling from the 1920s onto their campus is that they're able to get what they want. I mean, we saw this at the University of Missouri where, uh, you remember with all the, uh, hysteria that was going on there in November 2015, uh, with the, you know, the poop swastika and all that. And that got the university president, uh, removed is that at some point in time they thought that the entire Ku Klux Klan had invaded their campus and they're like, there's bricks being thrown through windows. Everybody stay in shelter. Police, like the National Guard is here to stop them. There was like no Klansmen whatsoever on campus. I mean, we almost wonder, it's almost like satanic ritual abuse from the 1980s. Everybody keeps imagining that Klansmen are somehow wandering around on campus. And even though there's far more people who've claimed alien abduction than there are Klansmen in the United States. So the one thing that can happen is that you almost, these administrators need to realize, like, you need to stop coddling these kids and stop giving in to their uh, dumb hysteria. And a lot of them, uh, 
my interaction with college administrators is that they, they have no backbones. They're just lazy. They don't do anything. They'll just give anything to the, the student who screams the most. But that's when almost the state comes in. I mean, I know a lot of your listeners aren't probably going to like this, but you almost have to use state uh, legislative bodies to tell these administrators, if you keep funding these stupid programs, if you keep, like, uh, suppressing free speech, we're going to cut off your funding, we're not going to help you out. And that's almost what Donald Trump did um, in response to the UC Berkeley riot. If they're not going to protect Milo's right to free speech, if they're just going to let rioters assault and commit property damage and just and police are just going to sit there inside doing nothing, we're not going to give you any more funding. And they kind of need to realize they need an opposing pressure point that will counteract the pressure coming from campus activists. And that can only from right now come from the state. But if you, I mean, there's another way to avoid the state. I know a lot of us are probably not that big on the state, and I understand why. I mean, state isn't always very good. I mean, we saw that with the last eight years. But the other thing is, is parents themselves can do as, as, Americans do anytime when there's they don't like a product because of its products. They can go somewhere else. They can refuse to go to these campuses that don't allow, that don't foster free speech. That always ha- let these campus activists get their way. They can go to schools where they push back against campus activists, where they s- celebrate free speech, where they protect it, where Milo is not uh, having to be shut down because people set you know uh, fires on campus. So that's it, those are kind of the two best ways is that parents start picking rewarding schools that protect free speech and do not get cave in to campus activists. And they also use their power to ask their state lawmakers to push back against it. I mean, if you're going to send your kid to four years to feel bad just for, you know, being white and have, and be hit with a steel pipe, if he goes to you see a conservative speaker, what's the point of sending your kid, uh, you know, for four years and take out a hundred thousand dollar loan? What's the point of that? Send them to where, uh, their rights are going to be respected, and they're actually going to get a good education. I want to talk about your chapter on uh, fraternities mm-hmm. because I had no connection with that, and, and my college didn't really officially have them. But even though they don't didn't officially have them, they're still getting rid of the ones they unofficially have, as it turns out. It's not my thing, absolutely not in any way my thing. I would be – I would stick out like a sore thumb there. I would hate every minute of being there. But my view was always – you know, let people do what they want to do. It doesn't bother me that people are doing that. They're not harassing me. Let them do their thing. But now even that is being targeted because why? Well, they're being targeted because – and it's, it's a very specific type of fraternities. It's not all fraternities. As, you, as you're probably aware of, there are fraternities that are historically African-American, and there's also multicultural fraternities. Those are left alone. They don't care about that because – they're primarily intended for minority identity groups and protected classes. So they don't care about them. They care about the traditional historically white fraternities and sororities. And the reason why they hate them is because one, they're predominantly white Two, most of the values and most of the students there are, are, are Republicans and conservatives. And a lot of the values they promote, there's like traditional feminine roles, traditional masculine roles that, that are there. It's almost like in some ways the 1950s come back with a lot more added booze and debauchery, of course, but, they the, and those are the reasons why, and also the just the values that they promote. It's, so it's primarily the predominantly white, and the values they promote are very different from the campus left. They don't, they're not checking the white privilege every day. They're not giving into gender norms. They're not using uh, the proper gender neutral pronouns. All that matter, and that's why they're targeted. It's they stick out like a sore thumb on college campuses now, and that's why they're targeted. And every time that they that some of these hap- incidents happen, of course, there's some. Uh, notorious incidents involving fraternities as the uh, 2015 incident at the University of Oklahoma where a uh, fraternity was caught uh, engaging in a very racist, hateful uh, chant, and of course there was a uh, necessary backlash against that. But then all of fraternity culture was seen as this uh, the seedbed of white supremacy on campus and that students are put in danger. And the main reason that the campus left targets them is their dissidents on campus. This is a place where, to use their terminology, it's a safe space for conservative students, for students who don't want to participate in, in checking their white privilege and people who don't want to kind of engage in all this uh, crazy stuff that the rest of the campus is going in. So fraternities and stories present that. They can just be normal, have a good time, uh, and hang out with like-minded people and in a way that it also excludes a lot of other people. And they don't, they also don't like that as well. And the reason, but the two primary reasons that they go after them is 
predominantly white, which is always a bad thing. They always suspect if anything doesn't have meat uh, diversity quotas, it must be terrible. It must be some neo-Nazis lingering around. And the values that they promote are very different from the rest of the campus left. You know, uh, opera houses and uh, orchestras really ought to watch out because th- they have a very, very non-diverse audience. So that, but that's probably a Klan rally in disguise. As soon as they get in there, the tuxedos come off and, you know, they've got all the overhead projectors lined up with the, with the, with the white things on them. It's just, it's just totally crazy. Hopefully none of the actors are, uh, have any white sheets on. I mean, that are or set any, uh, stage fires. Then it's going to get really troublesome. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing to me. All right. So you've got, in this book, you have chapter titles that are so provocative that if anybody on campus knew you'd written this book, you would be getting the Milo Yiannopoulos treatment. The Cult of Diversity, Political Correctness in the Age of Microaggressions, Victimhood Culture, Identity Politics, Guilty of Being White, Rape Culture Feminism. I did an episode on that. Greeks Under Siege, Art of the Hoax, which, of course, we know there are plenty of the almost more than we can keep track of. This is a, a great one-stop shop for um, – in case the headlines aren't quite enough and you want the real story of exactly what's going on, this book will give it to you. Tell me something about the foreword, because it's written by a certain provocateur, as I mentioned before. Yeah, well, Milo, uh been connected with him for a little bit right now, and I thought, you know, I'm writing this book, and who better else to explain in his own perspective what's going on on campus than Milo himself. I mean, he deals with this up front and close in his tour. He's He's been involved in a lot of the worst incidents. Uh, even before the UC Berkeley thing, there was that notorious uh, DePaul one, which we thought was violent at the time because there was people, there's a few of his supporters being punched and uh, kind of shoved around and police once again didn't do anything. And then protesters were able to get on stage and threaten him with violence and the police just stood around and did nothing. So that was already happening there, and that was happening in this uh, summer 2016. So this, these events were already happening. So I was like, who better else to explain from his own perspective what's going on campuses? And most of his forward, he just explains what has happened, what has happened so far, how we've seen these identity politics go out of hand, how victimhood culture is, uh, how victimhood culture in his own uh, speeches is used to shut him down and to suppress other people who are also have. Uh, who are also dissidents on campus. And that's what he shares in his forward. So it's great to have him uh, speak out with the book because there's arguably nobody better who represents kind of the most hated figure of the campus left and who has the most experience with them than Milo Yiannopoulos. Uh, you know, I'm probably, I don't agree with him on some things as I think through it, but to me that is so utterly secondary right now. And yeah, he's provocative, but not in any, I don't think it's, particularly nothing bad i think about what he does i think he's 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 funny most of the time he's very quick-witted he's quick on his feet i i respect that but as i've said repeatedly i think given what we're facing we're reduced to saying yeah we need to be as provocative and in your face as we can possibly be because these people can't be fought back against hard enough because if somebody like milo got in charge yeah you wouldn't like a few things he did there's no question about that but if these we all pe- have weird hair dyes <laughs> yeah that's right but 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 if these people got in charge it, i mean it, it would seriously be a totalitarian nightmare because of the, their view that the other side is not even human and and the funny thing is that's what they think we think about them i don't think that about them i don't think that about anybody but, I, I mean, I actually think they have a point of view. I think it's dumb, but I'll sit and listen. They they will not return the favor. And, of course, it's different. It's not a double standard. It's different for them because we're full of hate and we're terrible. But that that's just arguing in a circle. You, you know, uh, well, you have to argue it on the merits at some point. Uh, the book is called No Campus for White Men, The Transformation of Higher Education into Hateful Indoctrination by Scott Greer. Obviously, people can get this book on Amazon. I'm going to link to it at tomwoods.com slash 840. But um, is there anything else you want? I mean, other than Daily Caller, do you have any any link you want to send people to if they want to follow you? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Scott M. Greer. Uh, you can also see uh, if, if I say something pretty provocative, you can also see the left going hysterical on my tweets on a daily basis. Uh, not as bad as them writing, but it's still quite entertaining. And you could just follow me on at Twitter on Scott Scott M. Greer and follow me on Daily Caller. I write columns very frequently there. All right, I'll see if I can get a uh, a column archive for you there. I assume you've got one. 
Uh, yeah, it's, I have an author page there. It's like author Scott Dash Greer. All right, so I'll, I'll link that. So, so, so Tom was com slash eight forty. We'll link to the book, to your article archive, to your Twitter. So, if you're driving around, everybody, you don't have to try to remember all this stuff. Just go to Tom was com slash eight forty, and it'll all be there. Best of luck with the book, Scott. Uh, as I say, I wanted to get you on quickly because the Milo thing is still reverberating through the news cycle. But even if I'd missed you this time, there's always next time. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, Tom. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for today. But do not turn this episode off because, boy, are you in for a treat. Wait till you see this new site created by a listener of the show, dissidentmama.net. Now, not .com, not .com, because dissidentmama.net has as its tagline, smashing sacred cows with a bang, not a whimper. And you can read the description of the site, very interesting and provocative. It's basically a, a woman who was once on the left and who's now very anti-PC and pro-libertarian. And she's talking about when she was going around looking for names for the site, she said she stumbled upon dissidentmama.com, who describes herself as a crunchy, contrarian, liberal hipster mom writing about life, parenting, and politics. And so dissidentmama.net says, well, these descriptors are so not dissident. In fact, they're not even vaguely rebellious. They're not only acceptable, but they're expected and predictable. So forget dissidentmama.com, my friends, because dissidentmama.net is on the scene now. Going to be posting regularly, got posts on things like the Women's March and what's going on at the universities and Lee and Jackson, all kinds of different fun topics to explore at dissidentmama.com. I almost said .com. Don't do that. Dissidentmama.net is the site we're talking about. I'm going to link to it at tomwoods.com slash 840, which is today's show notes page. And of course, the creator of DissidentMama.net gets all my goodies. The two dozen free uh, video tutorials of the mention here on the, on the show, a link on my site, membership in my bloggers group. All these are free bonuses you get when you get your web hosting through my special link. Get the details on that at TomWoods.com slash publicity. All right, that's it for this week. Next week, we got some fun stuff coming up, particularly my conversation with Bob Murphy about how we ought to be dealing with leftists who are suddenly concerned about the powers of government and secondly angelo cotavia i can't believe i got this guy that is an explosive conversation so if you haven't subscribed yet on itunes or stitcher please do subscribe to the tom woods show and if you are enjoying the show then please consider becoming part of the elite as a supporting listener at supportinglisteners.com see you next week Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.